Welcome to this presentation on the cardinal virtues. The moral act is the basis for our understanding of virtue. Virtue is a strength or capacity for living fully. Anyone can examine their conscience to consider their intentions, the object of their act, and the circumstances surrounding how they choose to live their life. The theological virtues, faith, hope, and love, invite us to lift our minds and elevate our lives towards Christ and the kingdom of God. As we discuss the cardinal virtues of justice, prudence, courage, and temperance, consider what difference might exist if you live these virtues motivated by faith, hope, and love, and an eternal horizon. Does it make a difference if you are pursuing happiness now, or are you willing to consider how the theological virtues might influence your sense of justice, courage, prudence, and temperance in the light of life in Christ. Does it make a difference? Consider the first cardinal virtue, justice. Justice is what is owed to God and one another. How does faith direct your sense of justice? Here's Monsignor Jeremiah McCarthy to discuss the cardinal virtue of justice. You know, a virtue is a power or a skill, and one of the virtues that is available to us, a skill that we have to understand the ordering of the various goods that are presented to us in life, is the great virtue of justice. Um, uh, St. Thomas has a very pithy way of talking about justice. The Latin is suum cuique, which simply means and to give to each one what is due to him or to her. So think about the basic obligations, duties, responsibilities that we encounter in our experience of life. What do we owe to our uh, spouse in marriage? What do we owe to our employers in terms of the work that we do? Uh, what do we owe to our society around us as members of the society, as citizens? How do we exercise the virtue of justice. There are di very dim different dimensions of justice. Uh, the church invites us to think about not only our individual relationships to one another, that's called commutative justice. And so what I owe to a friend, what I owe to a spouse, that's a good example of commutative justice, that one-on-one -on -one relationship. But we not only have individual relationships in our lives, we also have multifaceted relationships with a society around us. We participate in a whole network of goods, and how do we order those in our lives? So one way that we think about it is not just simply commutative justice, but distributive justice. Because as human beings, we need to participate in a range of goods to flourish and to thrive. We all need food, we need water, we need friendship, we need conversation, we need a good political order to help us navigate and bring together a lot of goods that we need to flourish and thrive. For example, education, uh, the opportunity to participate in the environment, to have good clean air, to breathe. Uh, Pope Francis has reminded us that we have an obligation to care for the planet in justice. How do we share that good in a way that allows each one of us to participate happily and to flourish and to thrive as a human person. So to give to each person what is due to him or to her, also for us to participate and to receive from society goods that we all need to flourish and thrive. And so this wonderful interdependent, interconnected vision of the virtue of justice is part of the Catholic tradition. There's a writer who once talks about the best kept secret in Catholic teaching is its great teaching of social justice. Social justice, how do we participate? How do we enable others to have access to the goods that they need? For example, medical care, uh, good hospitals, good schools. So Catholic social justice reminds us that as persons, we need to have the opportunity to work uh, to have a just living ways to support our families. So a very, very rich tradition that merits more conversation, which we will have, but that great Catholic teaching of social justice 
helps us to have that deep picture of God's goodness and grace in our lives. St. Thomas More thought that King Henry VIII of England was unjust by breaking the unity of the church when he married Anne Boleyn. St. Thomas More was beheaded. Was he prudent in speaking out against the king? Dr. Martin Luther King thought racism in American society was unjust. He suffered imprisonment in the Birmingham jail, and eventually he was assassinated. Was he prudent in protesting against racism? Archbishop Oscar Romero spoke out against the injustice in El Salvador, and he was shot to death by, during saying Mass. Was he prudent in opposing the forces of the left and the right in violent El Salvador? Prudence is about using right reason in decision-making. Monsignor McCarthy explains. What is prudence? That's a wonderful question. Um, St. Thomas says that prudence is recta ratio agibile. And what he means is it's right reason, our intelligence, acting well. I like to think of it as being intelligently decisive, right? That a prudent person knows when is the right time to take action. So the virtue of prudence is the virtue that helps us to act well. It requires us to step back and to take stock of things, to weigh pros and cons. And so a prudent person is appropriately decisive. Uh, there are opportunities and choices that we have to face all the time. And a prudent person is going to look at the risks and the benefits, the implications of a particular action, make that thoughtful discernment, and then take action. It's not a, it's not a virtue of sitting forever on the fence, uh, never leaping into the fray, but it's also not being foolish about uh, just simply being impetuous. The, all, the opposite of prudence, I think, is impetuosity. In other words, I just simply just wing it. I just make things up or I uh, just respond to stimuli around me. But the prudent person is the one who is aware of those challenges, those stimuli, those opportunities, and tries to make a, an intelligent calculus about whether this is something I should pursue or I shouldn't. This is something worthwhile for me to pursue. And if it is worthwhile for me to pursue, to evaluate, is this the right time to pursue it? What factors should I bring into the equation as I think about making a choice? Think about making a choice about uh, buying a car. You can perhaps pick up a used car or you might want to make a long-term investment in a new car. So you evaluate your resources and you prudently try to arrive at a good decision that you can afford. We don't want to make a foolish decision of trying to get the cheapest car on the market because you know that it's going to break down eventually. But what's the long-term investment? Uh, so weighing those pros and cons, uh, taking, a, taking a look at the risks and the benefits of a particular action, but then making a good decision. A decision means that you cut away other opportunities. That's what the word decision means, is to cut away. And so the prudent person cuts away a whole range of opportunities to allow this particular good to be realized here and now. And so that's what a good, prudent, thoughtful person is doing, being intelligently, calmly decisive and doing it that will enable us to realize the good to the fullest extent possible. Perhaps justice is more than what the law of the land may provide for. A prudence elevated by faith and hope may call us to speak out on another's behalf, although it may cost us dearly. St. Thomas More, Dr. King, and Archbishop Romero thought it prudent to please God, not the prevailing political climate. Their sense of the injustice of their circumstances encouraged them to raise their voices in protest. That took courage. Now, courage is something that can be available to everyone. Americans fought a horrible civil war over injustice to African-American slaves. Many men and women showed tremendous courage on both sides of that conflict. 
How does faith, hope, and love elevate courage? What role does faith, hope, and love play in directing courage? Monsignor McCarthy discusses courage. Courage, what an important quality that we all need in our lives. Uh, the virtue of courage, uh, fortitude is the classic term, but it really means the ability to be brave enough to do the good when it is tough. Think about times when you have had to be brave, perhaps. Maybe you've had the uh, courage to be brave when a friend of yours is being attacked by someone else and you stand up for them. You find the courage to speak out on their behalf so that they don't feel alone or isolated. That takes some deep courage from within and allows you to be a person who demonstrates goodness. So the courage that we find in our lives takes many different forms. It's the courage of a father and a mother and their family to uh, sacrifice for one another and for the children. Uh, the courage to get up in the morning to go to work. Uh, the courage to be faithful in our studies as high school students or college students. The courage to uh, do the right thing when it is difficult. And that's really what I think the virtue of fortitude is about. On the one hand, it's a virtue that requires our intelligence so that we uh, don't just simply run into a burning building foolishly. We want to make sure that we've got sufficient protection if we're a firefighter uh, to have enough protection to go in and do the job that we need to do. And so on the other hand, we don't want to fail to be brave when it's important. So a firefighter who would simply stay in the in the vehicle rather than go into the building would not be a brave firefighter, wouldn't be doing a firefighter's job. So when we run into circumstances and experiences in our life when it's sometimes difficult for us to stand up for the good, that's when the virtue of fortitude kicks in. Think about uh, perhaps someone who's being bullied at school. Do you have the courage to stand up for that person? Maybe it's not just, maybe you feel like you can't physically intervene to stop the bullying, but you can call attention, bring that to the attention of those who have authority and power to stop the bullying that takes place. So courage can take many, many different forms. It's moral courage, it's standing up for those qualities that we know are so important to us that if we don't stand up for ourselves, we know that we will be untrue to ourselves. Courage is expressed in our relationships in life, uh, the ordinary things that we do every day. Sometimes it's just brave enough to get up, get out of bed, and get at it. That's a brave thing to do, and that's an example of fortitude. How can we honor the virtue of justice in a prudent and courageous way if we can't control ourselves? The virtue of temperance is about self-control. The goal of temperance is to allow ourselves to freely live in community and honor our duties to God and to one another. Virtue is about a capacity for life. We cannot live a virtuous life if our life is out of our control. Think about the role of temperance under the direction of faith, hope, and love. Monsignor McCarthy discusses. The uh, documentary filmmaker Ken Burns has been very famous for his great uh, work on the Civil War. And most recently, he's done a very important uh, documentary on the history of prohibition. And it comes to my mind when I think about the virtue of temperance that I'd like to say a few words about here in this, in this clip. Uh, temperance, um, we often think of it as related to moderating our use of alcohol, and there's certainly a very important sense in which that's true. But uh, temperance is a wonderful virtue that is much bigger than only dealing with our use of alcohol and moderating uh, the need we have for drink and sustenance. Uh, temperance is really the virtue of balance and moderation among the many desires hungers that we call our appetites. As human beings, we have 
bodily desires for food and for nourishment, for, for drink, uh, to sustain our bodies. We have hungers for intimacy. We have desires uh, for sexual expression in our lives. And so these are, if you will, holy desires, uh, holy longings uh, that God has placed within us. And so the task that each of us has as a human person is how do we uh, integrate and order those hungers and desires, those appetites in our lives. So the virtue of temperance invites us to think about balance, uh, to make sure that we avoid extremes in the area, for example, the use of food. If we excessively overeat, as we know, it's called gluttony. We uh, harm ourselves because we put on excessive weight and we know all of the health implications that flow from our failure to be temperate in our use of food. On the other hand, if we don't get enough food, we know that we harm our bodies by not providing the sufficient nourishment that we need. So. We need to be thoughtful and balanced in exercising and opening and honoring that appetite, that deep desire that is a good that God has placed within us. So if we misuse our appetites, that's where we run into the area of darkness or sinfulness in our lives. We have a hunger for intimacy and sexuality. God has placed a sexual desire in each and every one of us. As a matter of fact, the virtue of chastity in St. Thomas's overview of all the virtues, chastity is part of the virtue of temperance. So chastity is that particular skill that allows us to understand the good of sexuality, both in terms of its drive for appropriation, for bringing forth life into the world, as well as that drive for distinctive, intimate, interpersonal relationship with a significant person in our lives. So chastity helps us to honor the goodness of sexuality. If we misuse that gift, we're in the arena again of sinfulness, not the arena of grace. So in our society, as you know, one of the great challenges with the internet is the access to uh, images of sexuality that are very destructive, that in a sense reduce our human personality to just simply our sexual organs as instruments of pleasure. And we know what great damage that does. That's why we are so concerned about issues of pornography, because pornography deeply wounds our understanding of the gift of sexuality, rather than having it holy balanced understanding of this wonderful drive and good that God has placed within us, we exaggerate and we reduce it to a mere animal instinct rather than a power to help us flourish and thrive in relationship to others. So think about, again, temperance as that virtue of balance, of ordering these appetites, these wonderful goods, these hungers that God has placed within us. The moral life is our response to the call to the wedding banquet. The theological virtues direct the cardinal virtues toward their ultimate fulfillment in God. It is helpful to think of the life of virtue as lived out among people like St. Thomas More, Dr. King, and Archbishop Romero. You will notice the video biographies of various saints on this topic page. Father James Martin, a Jesuit, wrote a book entitled my Life with the Saints, explaining why he found each of these saints inspiring. Listen to one or more of these biographies before our next class and be prepared to offer your thoughts about how faith, hope, and love direct our moral life. How does the life of grace affect our understanding of justice, temperance, prudence, and courage? Much there to think about.